Thank you, sir. So, uh, does anybody dispute the bottom statement that I'm the oldest person in the room? So, what, what I want to do, uh, I mean, this is part of giving old people jobs, right? Tuan was nice enough to invite me and say something that only I can do, because I'm the only person that's been around for 50 years seeing this field evolve. Uh, but, okay, yeah, a lot of it's to wake you up and tell jokes, but there is a purpose which is for young people to give you a context in which to think about building your career. So you're going to hear largely about mine, that's the bias part, as Stuart said. But to understand how this evolves, that is, why physics is so much fun, mostly because it's populated by crazy people, physicists. Uh, but also because of the surprises, right? We learn and we make progress often in ways we didn't expect. In some very real sense, looked at, as we'll talk about in a minute, from 50 years ago, the dark era, dark ages of particle physics. Nobody would have thought about jets at the time because we didn't have a theory and we didn't have experiments, and so we were rather limited. Okay. So, I, congratulations. You now get to spend all your money in Geneva, but it's really exciting. I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time there over the years, and it's really fun. Um, as an aside, I, I grew up, most people don't know this, I grew up in a French town, Detroit, better known as Detroit. Uh, and so I have a rather peculiar accent in French. And the first time I went to Geneva in the early 70s, in those days, if you spoke with a peculiar accent, me, the shopkeepers would simply walk away. They wouldn't serve you unless you had learned to speak appropriately, which is really hard for somebody from Detroit. All right, congratulations, welcome to CERN. So, the Dark Ages, 1960, all we had was QED. The, the 60s is relevant, so 50 years ago, I was starting graduate school uh, at Caltech, where I was a graduate student. There was one course for one quarter on quantum field theory. It was QED, taught by Dick Feynman, that, which is cool, but he's not much for pedagogical instruction. And, you know, it was a solved theory from his standpoint, so it went very quickly. Um, so here's, that's Dick, yeah? Great guy, a lot of fun. Uh, so there was an argument for why you didn't need to teach field theory because it clearly wasn't relevant, right? There was QED, which was clearly field theory. In those days, didn't really understand the renormalization group, so that was an aside. Weak interactions, there was a four, the gamma of Teller for fermion, which you clearly couldn't iterate, so that clearly wasn't a theory. The strong interactions were strong and didn't know what to do, and they were a mess. Uh, so all the arguments actually turned out to be wrong, but they didn't teach field theory. On the other hand, Murray, Gelmott taught one hour a week, and I thought of it as Murray telling us what he did the night before, because literally that's what we talked about. He didn't spend a lot of time teaching Murray. Um, but it was clear to the students that the language that Dick Feynman and Murray Gelmott used was quantum field theory. Right? That the models they used, even though they didn't have the right theory, were always in that language. So, Ah, I'm sorry, I forgot to show Murray. Ah, handsome guy, still alive, cool. So, um, this was the time of student revolts in the U.S. Revolting not against Mr. Trump, we're learning about that again, but about the war in Vietnam. And so, I led a student revolt and demanded, can you imagine this, students demanding they teach us quantum field theory. And, um, Actually, there were two issues. The, the faculty at Caltech mostly went to Aspen in the summer. So, I don't know if you know this, the, uh, the, wet, the air in Pasadena in 1966 was not actually believable, believable, breathable. All right, you, you know about pollution. So they would go away in the summer. So the student revolt said, we demand that you stick around and teach us something in the summer. And Murray, in his wisdom, pulled out his checkbook and wrote us all, literally, wrote us all on the spot, checks for $200, and said, nope, you go away. 
All right. So uh, they said, all right, we'll teach field theory. And my thesis advisor, Steve Frouchy, who is actually still active at Caltech, was chosen to teach the field theory course. So no standard model. In the strong interactions, we had S matrix. How many people have studied the S matrix theory or Reggie Poles? Huh? Huh? Good. OK. I mean, it's not like they're wrong. It's just we never use them. All right. No standard model. No colliders. No jets. Just low energy collisions in the laboratory dominated by the production of resonances and soft pions. OK, so that's where we started. Yeah. Can you believe it? It was really bad. Ah, no email, no archive, no cell phones, no Facebook, where a lot of our colleagues learn about physics on Facebook, right? And that's where all the good rumors are. And for those of you who don't know it, when you programmed the computer, you did it with punch cards. Huh? Now, the good thing about punch cards is they're not destroyed by cosmic rays, unlike silicon. But it, you, know, you have to carry them around in a big box. They're numbered. There's one for every line of code. So you've got a program with a 1,000 lines of code that you've got 1,000. And you trip. Really frustrating trying to figure out what order those cards should be in. All right. It was not a good time for science, friends. Ah, but good things were going on. Dick was starting his parton model. He was not actually worried about jets or deep inelastic scattering when he started. He was worried about it, setting up a model where he could understand the resonances and particularly the soft pions that were made. And so a dominant feature was the fact that there were wee partons with a distribution DE over E, a logarithmic number of them, which built in the logarithmic number of pions. A big question was, for him, they were dynamical objects, the partons, and not necessary, necessarily Murray's Gellman's quarks, which were algebraic objects. The difference, right, the quarks came in to tell us about quantum numbers, and the partons were to tell us about the dynamics of collisions. Murray and Dick had offices on the same hallway with a secretary in between to keep them from fighting, but they would talk a lot about Murray would say, those partons are not quarks. Right? Big battle went on for a long time. You know the answer, right? They really were quarks, but OK. And there was also this experiment going on at Slack where they scattered electrons. You all know electrons are red, yeah? And photons are blue. Partons are black. OK, so there was this scattering. And that was named after James Bjorkane, better known as BJ. He's such a sweet guy. It's small b, small j. And so we want to talk, that was important. So I remember when the people came to Caltech in the late 60s to talk about this experiment. It was really important because of this wonderful result. So here's the kinematics. You've got the proton, which is sitting still because it's the laboratory, the electron coming in and coming out. It gets scattered through some angle, and there's this photon with momentum Q, momentum squared Q squared, which depending on your metric is either positive or negative, but this guy is going to be positive. And Bjorkane's contribution here was to say, let's define this dimensionless ratio. And also, this is a dimensionless description of how much energy is transferred. And simply, relativity and spin tells you that if what you're bouncing off is spin a half, which is a proton or a parton maybe, this dimensionless quantity has this invariant structure, spin flip versus non-flip. And then the question is, these distribution functions do they vary with Q squared, right? If you're bouncing off of a pudding, then they fall very rapidly with Q squared because there's no granular behavior in there. And if you're bouncing off a point particle, then it's just a number. And if you took the data, here's, so I'm going to show you original data. Huh? This goes back to 1966 when figures were not drawn with a computer because there was no way to tell a bunch of punch cards to draw a picture, right? So we had human beings drawing all these. Can you imagine that picture? And, and if you plot it versus this variable, notice all these different Q squares lie along a line. They scaled, hence BJ scaling. And so if you took that literally, then the interpret wa interpretation was that partons were fermions because there were the two Fs, 
with non-zero probability that is a, to carry a finite fraction of the mo proton's momentum, so that's the fact that it's not zero here when x is away from zero. And it really looked good, at least approximately, right? So we had this happenstance that because the data was frankly not all that good, it told us an answer which turned out to be wrong, but for a while we believed it, right? And that was really relevant. Of course, it's approximately right, even in QCD, but it's important. Is it clear what I'm trying to say? I mean, crappy experiments can be a wonderful thing. Right? Raise your hands and agree. All right, sorry. If, if my style is driving you crazy, you won't be the first one. All right, so big question. They smelled like quarks, but how could they be free? There was this interesting side story that if they were quarks and they were essentially free, why don't we find them, right? So maybe they were laying on the floor in labs, but there was this industry for a while to look for them. So one idea was it took really big energies, and so maybe they were produced in the collision of cosmic rays with seawater for millennia, and they just settled to the bottom of the sea, and they were collected by the mollusks, the shelled animals that lived down there. So one of the things that people did, in particular George Zweig, how many people know... George Weig, there's George. He was the guy who predicted quarks at about the same time Murray did, but he didn't read as much as Murray. So he called them aces instead of quarks for Mr. Mark. So he didn't become famous. Luckily, Murray hired him and he was at Caltech. So he was one of the guys, he, creative guy, who wanted to look for these. So he spent a lot of money grinding up oyster shells and clamshells looking for charged two-thirds. Didn't find it. So actually he left physics and went off to study the physics of ears, which he's done really well. But he was one of the guys who interacted with the students most. And he said, get out of the field, it's over, right? What kind of counseling is that for young people? I'm telling you, stay in the field, it's fun. All right. Uh, and already, at, so in the late 60s, Dick was talking about E plus, what was talked about here yesterday, E plus, E minus, goes to parton, anti-parton, and then the sprays of stuff, jetty final states. So that was already in his lectures in the late 60s, but without all the formalism we have today. So it really does go back 50 years. All right, so here's the parton picture in the 70s. Important thing, no QFT for this. Confining soft stuff, scale of 100 MeV, those interactions, the confining interactions were assumed to be dilated in the center of mass, so protons come in and you could think of them as largely frozen in time because the soft interactions binding the partons were looking slow in that frame. That was the language that Dick used, and seminars would start with, imagine all of this is true, even though we can't derive it from anything except the data. All right. They're always confined at long distances compared to a theory, but act freely, freely at short distances. Uh, and going back to what the experiment at SLAC, you imagine describing the structure in terms of this distribution function, the parton distribution functions hereafter called PDF. So this is before portable format documents, when PDF actually meant something. All right. Uh, then the outgoing partons fragmented, and there was a fragmentation function to go with this, approximately, describing how the energy was shared with the original hadrons, but no quantum field theory, which there was this schism in the US. This was an honorable thing to do on the West Coast. On the East Coast, where they were still teaching quantum field theory and assigning problems like find the renormalization group, for various field theories. You weren't allowed to say things like that, but we could give talks on this on the West Coast. Interesting effect. So, all right, starting in the 70s, people started to work out stuff. Berman Bjork came, so we've seen this guy. Don't have a picture of Sam. Here's a picture of John Kogut. Not a very good picture, but okay. So he eventually went into computers and then worked to work for the enemy, the DOE. Ah, and there, huh? Huh? Steve Ellis is a hippie. All right. So 
already in the early 70s, we worked out this picture, but in the Parton language, not in QCD. There was the first proton collider at your institution, CERN, called the Intersecting Storage Rings. Now, it wasn't really an accelerator. It was a storage ring, but it was in a circle. And the protons came around and collided at energies substantially larger. Before that, tens of GeV. Now, suddenly, we got up to 50. So you might have thought that jets would start to play a role. On the other hand, the detector technology wasn't up to it. Right? We had been talking about fixed target. And so all the experiments, right, if, if you're in the laboratory, fixed target, a beam, everything gets boosted in a very narrow cone in the laboratory. So the detectors they used were all single-armed. That is, covering a very small fraction of phase space, and they hung them on this intersection. No four pi, just a bunch of single arms looking at pions, and it was primarily pions going in one direction. On the other hand, there was this really exciting result from CCOR. How many people know what CCOR is? Huh? Columbia, sorry, CERN, Columbia, Rutherford, one of those fixed targets. They looked at pi zeros. How do you detect pi zeros? Photons. They decay the photons, so you need a photon. So they use something called lead glass, which converts the photons into enough electrons to measure them. So what he observed, what they observed, and I heard about this from somebody called Leon Letterman, another Nobel Prize winner, but I don't have a photograph, sorry. Uh, this dimensionless cross-section, S squared, that's the total energy squared times the phase space distribution of the pi zeros inclusively, plotted in terms of the scaling variable, 2pt over root s, xt, it looked like it was described by a scaling function. 1973, I was about to go off to CERN, I was really excited, BJ was right. Uh, unfortunately, Leon was wrong. The thing about lead glass is, if you put it in a high radiation zone, it ages, actually rather quickly, and their efficiencies went to pot. So, when they understood what was going on, the cross-section didn't go like S squared, like a dimensionless result. It went like S to the 4.12, which isn't dimensionless scaling behavior. Ah. Well, it was fun while it lasted. Okay. And then along came our friends, Gross, Pollitzer, Frank Wilczek, who got the answer right, right? They'd been assigning this at Princeton for years. Tony Z had done it, but gotten the wrong sign. So, uh, important thing, for those of you who know television, there's this program, The Big Bang Theory, and in an early episode, they talk about this issue of the SIGN in the running of the couplet. How many people have seen it? I have it on my laptop, if we want to watch it during a break. Huh? There is an important character who's an Indian, right? And it's, all right. So they said, ah, well, the running of the coupling goes like minus sign, minus sign. This beta, this number is obviously positive if the flavor are too many flavors, and in those days there weren't, still aren't. So it goes like one over logarithm. So indeed, when this scale, this, what you should think of as a resolution scale, the wavelengths of all the things being exchanged at that energy scale, when it gets big compared to this scale of QCD, which is order 200 MeV, the coupling gets small, just what Dick wanted and BJ wanted. The quarks at short distances, short time scales are free, and when this goes right, when this logarithm becomes the logarithm of one, one over zero is a really big number, which is at least consistent with this idea that they're confined at long distances. All right, and as you talked about yesterday, another feature of this theory is that there are often collinear singularities. When the gluons being emitted are low energy or collinear with the quarks, there are logarithms that blow up. All right, so, oh, oh, went too fast. So there was this era, as was talked about yesterday, with event shapes. When we now, without shame or embarrassment, do perturbative calculations of strong interactions. So there was 
but five years of doing this stuff in E plus E minus, including something you didn't mention yesterday, energy, energy correlations, which were done in Seattle, huh? Uh, included in that were, was this paper by George Sturman and Steven Weinberg, jets from QCD. Now, it's important to realize that although the words jets were used in this era, there were no jet algorithms. They didn't really mean jets. What they meant was the event shape was very pointy. So it, it was a property of the whole event that it had two sprays or three sprays. And indeed, one of the exciting features that came out from Petra, that E plus E minus machine in the late 70s at Daisy, was that some of the events measured by the event shape had this three-prongy nature, and in some somewhat imprecise sense, the gluon was discovered. Uh, we also know that it's not scale invariant, that's because of the soft and collinear, and so all those distributions have the feature that as you increase the momentum, so Q2 greater than Q1, this tail goes down, so it's less likely that you're going to find energetic partons, well, quarks and gluons, and more likely things are going up at small z as you increase Q, and that's just what you expect, right? It's an interactive theory. Every quark, every gluon is surrounded by a cloud of gluons and virtual quark pairs, and as you peel things away by going to larger Q, larger mu, shorter wavelengths, you're peeling the onion and there's less in the center. And there, so there, it's less likely you find a component of the proton at that size that carries most of the momentum, and more likely that you find a lot of soft stuff. So, all right, that's all good. We know how to factorize those singularities, put them in these running distributions, the distributions that like the coupling change with the scale mu. And this concept that you've already learned about infrared safe, if you carefully define the quantities you're trying to measure and calculate, then these will not play any role except that things will scale with mu, but there'll be no real infinities. You can do the measurement you can do the calculation. You can't do things like calculate the number of soft pions. Right? That took you through the confinement regime, and you couldn't do that. Any questions? All clear? You've had a weekend to learn all this stuff, and it's now all absolutely obvious? And we've come a long way. 15 years. Uh, sort of, yeah. 1980s. Okay. So, uh... We started talking about jets, but we still don't have algorithms. The picture looks like this. This is a historic picture. Appeared in the 1970 papers. Right. Drawn by an artist. So, in comes the distribution function. Something hard happens in this red box. Out comes partons, quarks, and gluons, and they fragment into stuff, and there's uh, an important feature that there's an underlying event, right? If I have two what we now believe are colored singlets, and you take a quark out of both, now that fragments, the resulting stuff is still colored, and so it interacts. And so superimposed for PP collisions on top of our jets will always be this underlying event, which is really important at the LHC, where the luminosities are such that every time there's a crossing, there are 100 proton collisions, and there's all this crap. And we got to come back to not being worried about that. Okay? I, I wanted to show you one formula. We're not going to calculate it. It's not in the homework. Oop, what did I miss? Ah, really important point. Particularly because we talked yesterday as if jets were well defined. And the trouble with having jets come from colored partons is that when they get to your detector, they're always made out of color singlet hadrons, and that means there cannot be a one-to-one -one mapping. It must be true that this concept of jets are ambiguous at some level. It may be a numerically tiny level, but when we take an algorithm and we say, I'm going to pick these 75 hadrons out of that final state of 1,000 hadrons and call it a jet, it can't be precisely the kinematics of the original quark. Because the quark 
was colored. And that final part of the final state isn't. Okay, is it clear what I'm trying to say? So there's always some fuzziness about jetty stuff. So just be worried because some of the time it'll bother you. So there's no, there can't be a single correct answer for what's a jet. Right? It's like the smile of the Cheshire cat. You know it when you see it, but it's hard to describe and you can't, you know what I'm talking about? Okay. So uh, later in the 80s, real jet-defining algorithms started to appear. So here's E plus E minus now in QCD with a gluon. Uh, and, and so now we get to start on real jets in the sense of having algorithms. In 86, the Jade experiment said, all right, here's a way to think about jets. The final state is a list of hadrons, literally a list. And I'm going to write an algorithm that takes the list of hadrons and converts it into a list of jets. So I'm going to do that pairwise. So for every pair in that list of partons, well, Right? So I'm going to use a language interchangeable between theory and experiment. Experimentally, it's a list of things you see in your detector. Pions, but kaons, protons. Typically, you don't know what the particles are, and you don't really care if they're energetic enough. Theoretically, it's quarks and gluons, and I'm going to use it as if those things are almost the same, because I just admitted they're not exactly the same, but it isn't going to matter numerically. So I, I take a list, I look at every pair, I calculate this quantity, ignoring really particle masses because we don't know what the particles are anyway. And then I look at the ordered list of this thing, which is nearly the invariant mass of the pair. Uh, I identify the pair with the smallest, and I combine them. So this was actually, these weren't typically called jets. They were called clusters because you were clustering together stuff and you would take the lowest guy, the lowest pair, add their four momenta, gave you a new list with one less thing in it and you just iterated this until every pair had a value of y above some cutoff, which is essentially an infrared cutoff. We know there are problems in the soft, so there's always got to be some cutoff. So this was, in my mind, the first dead algorithm. Okay, before most of you were born, I'm guessing, right? How many people were born before 1986? Yeah, okay. That's good, that's okay, that's all right. How many people were born before 1950? Okay, so I was right, I'm the oldest person, all right. But a uh, small detail in 1990, four years later, it was realized that this really had some problems if you looked at it to high orders. And so at a meeting in Durham, a new algorithm was generated. The, the difference here is, notice this had K and L, so it could get small because one of them was really soft, but always had the other guy in. This takes the minimum of the square, so dimensionally it's the same. But the way it works to all orders is different. And that was called KT, which is the basis of most of the ones we have today. Important thing, E plus E minus starts with a hard collision. Everything in the final state came from this evolution of hard scattered partons and quarks. And so in this algorithm, everything's in a jet. The actual number of jets you get depends on what number you cut. And this was actually used as an observable in the early days. But the number of jets depended on that. So the number of jets was not itself a well-defined thing, even though you kept saying it was sort of yesterday. Look, at you look at an event, and some of them really look three jet-like, but whether you, with this algorithm, you got three dependent on what this arbitrary theoretical number was. All right, so we started using this. I was actually at that meeting, it was fun. I changed the direction of the world. All right, so what happens in the 80s into the 90s? Along comes the SP bar P acid CERN, much higher energies. So hundreds of GeV, I notice it doesn't say. And finally, four pi detectors. Huh? And most importantly, Carlo Rubia. 
He's the guy who makes science fun, huh? By driving you crazy. Okay, so there was UA1 and UA2. They found the W and the Z. Unfortunately, they didn't find Susie. So how many people have read Nobel Dreams? <laughs> it's required reading in Seattle. It's a, so Carlo, bless his soul, that machine probably wouldn't have existed without him. So they wouldn't have found the W and the Z. And there were events. They, they weren't using algorithms yet. Well, they were using algorithms, but not the E plus E minus ones. And by standards, they were rudimentary. But they talked about events with a jet on one side and nothing on the other. Mono jet events. At least five of them. And you weren't allowed to look at them unless you were blessed by Carlo. They were carried around in a handbag by his assistant on magnetic tape, and you weren't allowed to see them unless you were chosen. But we heard about them. Okay. So in this book, ah, so Carlo thought he was going to get two Nobel Prizes, W and Z and Susie, so he hired a writer who had just graduated from Harvard, Gary Taus, who has since become a famous science writer, who came to Geneva to learn about this and write a book. So you should read the book, mostly because I'm in the book. Uh, and I'm described in a way that you will find completely believable after today. Okay, so what, what lessons did we learn except that there wasn't Susie yet? In these collisions, the important thing, unlike E plus E minus, where the events are kind of roundish with jets, there's, these guys are cylindrical because there's superimposed all this debris from the proton which stretches things out along the beam direction. So. I'm sure you've learned about rapidities and pseudo-rapidities, yeah? You know about those? Which is this logarithmic variable to make things finite. And indeed, the, the, the structure of those events is there's a fairly uniform distribution of soft stuff along the beam pipe, uniform in azimuth and in rapidity, and that's this underlying event. And then we also learned about Lego plots, you know where Legos are made, yeah? Switzerland? Huh? So you take this cylinder and wrap it, and you get these wonderful pictures that look like apartment buildings. Those are the jets. And parking lots, those are the leptons. All right. So this, oh, it didn't, didn't, oh, we'll get those guys in a minute. So here's what a jet looked like at UA1 distribution. We knew there was this stuff going on at the edge, so it was thought that associated physics was spraying out of the jet, and unassociated physics was sneaking into the jet, which is true, but it's, that's a very classical picture in the sense that these things are all colored, and they're correlated by quantum mechanics. That's what this is, but quantum mechanics. So, it was 1990, clearly felt after the experiences at CERN and the coming Tevatron at Fermilab that we should, the theorists and the experimentalists, that's a theme here, they should talk to each other. But we got together in Snowmass and we said, let's reach an agreement. Let's decide how we're going to define jets. And the experimentalists at CDF and D0 can find those jets. And the theorists, in this case, Ellis Kunst, that's who we're looking at, that's Zoltan Kunst, Dave Soper. We would have a definition that we could calculate a cross-section and we could compare it. So there was this thing defined by as the iterative cone. So what happened? What happened? I'm sorry. So this is supposed to be over here? Uh, uh. All right, so look at the really purpley stuff. And ignore I you broke my slides. I know that. So plop down in this rapidity azimuth space, plop down a circle, that's going to be the end of the cone. Look at everything in there, calculate the momenta and the so it inside this space. And then look at what for the some of those four vectors, do they add up? to a centroid that's at the center of the cone. And if they don't, move the cone. That's the iteration process. Move the cone around until, in some sense, you're sitting on top of the peak. So a lot like this picture. And that was the iterative cone. 
it was called when it's when the cone and the centroid were at the same point within some approximation that was your jet and so these guys these guys and that hippie you saw earlier did a cross-section we actually calculated a cross-section to next the leading order and compared it to the data of course the data was pretty crappy but it agreed and the important thing is 10 orders of magnitude right the dynamic range for the jets at the Tevatron, point by point not great accuracy either th theoretically or experimentally but over that range terrific agreement unlike e plus e minus this had parton distributions in it all kinds of uncertainties and so people started to believe qcd had been around <coughs> for 10 years but in a very real sense People didn't buy into actually being able to do hadron calculations, I would argue, until this came along. <gasps> so we were heroes. But it turned out that even though at Snowmass we had signed in blood that we would both use this algorithm, the experimentalist cheated. So they said, ah, crap, we're not going to look everywhere for these guys. We're going to look where we think they already are. So they used seeds. And the theory itself, the definition allowed, there was no reason why two stable cones couldn't overlap, that is, have some shared hadrons, which was a problem. And in order to deal with that, you'd have to decide what to do with this guy. You had to add some rules to the algorithm to decide whether this guy went with that jet or with that jet. And experimentalists being the thoroughly unreliable people that they are, CDF and D0 define different rules. Huh? You just can't trust these guys. So they were comparing data, but not really the same data. And sadly, that's a theme that's carried all the way through the history. Right? You know the fact that Atlas and CMF, until last summer, never published data using the same algorithm, right? There were the evensies, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and the odds, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9. For years, I begged them, and it's now happened at 0.4, but only at that one value. <laughs> but you can, they have published data. All right, so, and then there was this problem that if you had seeds and you required the theorists to have seeds, then it was now infrared unsafe. Numerically, it didn't, didn't matter at all, but there was a big philosophical discussion in the theory organization that this cone was a bad, bad thing, even though we'd used it for 10 years and it worked fine. Huh? Okay. But th that's also true that it's because both the theory and the experiment had 10% error bars and they were perfect agreement. Okay. So, by the mid-90s, it was decided we had to give up on this, and we had to find a recombination-style cone like the E plus E minus that worked for hadrons when you knew that there was a big part of the event that you didn't want to talk about, the beat jets that you were told about yesterday. And so Soper and Ellis came along, and, and then Stefano Catani and another group, this is both in 93, we were all at CERN, worked out a new one. So... Uh, Okay, so here's a picture. I, I want, where's it? That, here we go. Let's talk about this first. So here's the structure. Again, it's pairwise. The minimum of the momentum of the partons, the transverse momentum, big difference here, right? Since it's not round, it's cylindrical, you want to use transverse momentum, not total momentum. And you find the minimum to some power alpha, and there are three choices we're going to talk about. Then it's delta R over R, so this minimum. And in order to mo remove things from the beam jet, we defined particle by particle a single version of this. So then the question was, you found the minimum of this and tried to determine whether it was bigger. Well, you had both the, the pairwise and the single, and you found the minimum. If the minimum was one of these guys, then you just put him in the beam jet. If the minimum was a pair, then you merge the pair, add the four vectors, and redo it, and redo it, and redo it. And the choices were having a one here, that was the good old Durham KT, Cambridge Aachen, which was zero, which just said, I want to order things by angle only, 
And then this guy, Gavin Salamat, appeared, what a hero, and he said, no, no, take it not to be one, but minus one, which to us old guys, oh God, you never picked that to be minus one, what a disaster. We were wrong. This worked really cool. It worked like the way we wanted the cone jet to work, but without all the crap. So he really was a hero. And even though it had never effectively been used at the Tevatron and studied systematically, the decision was made. That's what we'll do with the LHC, and it's worked fine. So I want just to show you, taking those different def definitions. So here's a seedless cone, kind of amorphous -y stuff. The KTs were, with positive, were particularly ugly, right? The, this, you don't really want a jet that looks like Great Britain seen from above. And the thing about anti-KT, because you draw a cone around the hottest guy in town, there's circles. Well, okay, sometimes the, the hottest guy takes a bite out of the next hottest guy, but even when he takes a bite, it looks like he's got really good teeth, right? It's a nice spherical... All right, you with me? Okay, so lessons, they're unique, no split merge junk, everything interesting is in a jet, nothing's left out, they're kind of amorphous if elf is greater than zero, but if it's less than zero, as our friends wanted, then it worked really well, so the use anti-KT at the LHC. So, as of 2005, so five years before the gadget turned on, four years before they blew up the magnets. Anti-KT, that's what we'll talk about from now on. Most of the data does not share an R value, that size parameter between the two experiments, but there is one unique example where they do it. Uh, as we'll talk about after the break, we think we know how to handle 100 simultaneous events. I think you know how to handle I'm a, oh, yeah. We think we know how to tag stuff. So the next step is the era of jet substructure, and that's what we'll talk about over the break, okay? We'll talk about the history. It's not quite as outrageous as this history, but I'll tell them, try to make it fun. All right, so that was the picture you wanted to talk about? Okay. So, okay, so I apply an algorithm to a final state, and it tells me what the jets are. And then I just go and I color all this. Remember, this is mostly calorimeter data, which is really an area on this Lego plot. So each color is a jet, a found jet. So the, the thing about these guys is they're pretty amorphous. The, remember, this axis is azimuth. So this point is the same color as that point because it's the same jet. I've just unwrapped it. All the same event, right? So there are three very energetic jets, the green, the blue, and the red, which we basically agree on. But the really slick thing about anti-KT, which was supposed to be what the cone jet did, is it has this nice circular boundary. And the other guys don't. I mean, that, that was the hit on these two guys from the very beginning, is there was no reason for the boundary to be smooth, and they weren't. And from the standpoint of correcting for the underlying event and pile up, that's awkward. When event by event, the shapes of the jets change. It's really nice that these guys are round always. At least the most energetic guys are. Sometimes there's a wimpy jet that gets bitten by an energetic jet. But yeah. Right, including the original cone. So Gavin Slam is a hero. It's called mathematics, right? Uh, if, you, if you think it, uh, yeah. So, but there's nothing. It's not really because you are waiting in such. A, you're taking a minimum. The most energetic guide to the minus one is the minimum value, so it always picks the most energetic guy and just collects the guys within R around it. No huggerty-buggerty. The other algorithms all say, I have the E waiting, but there's also an energy waiting, and so you'll take a hot guy here and then a wimpy guy over here, and you'll bounce around. And the order in which you cluster them is different. The, the, the nice thing about the anti-KT is it's unambiguous. It says, I take the hottest guy in town because one over him is the minimum value, 
And then I just select the guys in a nice circular region. There's no competition because it's dominated by that hot guy. And then once I've taken him out of the event, then I find the next most energetic guy and I do around him. And, and then when I'm done, I'm left with these funny shapes. But it's because I focus on the most energetic guy first that I get this nice round shape. Sorry? No. I, the only real difference is minus versus plus versus zero. Right? That's scaling. Those are the, right? There's one, there's minus one, and there's zero, and that's all there is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay? So I propose to let you go off and do something useful, and then we'll talk about substructure. Is that, boss, is that okay? It should be a prime number. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually my wife's view. But no, I mean, as we'll talk about in the substructure, the bias was first we went to big guys because we wanted to make sure big R, which we'd never done at Fermilab. The, there the magical number was 0.7. Almost the same R. I mean, it was in the context of that cone algorithm, but in practice, it's the same R. I mean, it means the same thing. So a 0.7 there is pretty close to a 0.7 here. And when the role, remember what, at Fairview Lab, we were really counting jets because we were worried, did we really understand the rates of jets? Here, we're going to talk about worrying about the substructure, so we want to capture the interesting substructure. So we move from 0.7 to 1, 1 1.2 initially to capture everything. But as the energy went up, the things you want to capture are being boosted enough they fit in pretty small cones, and the extra junk you pick up from the definition plays a smaller role if I can do a cone size. So then the dynamic of what's the right answer move from big cones to the, what's the smallest cone? I mean, I, to be honest, I'm amazed at how well the science works at 0.4. And it's anti-KT, but with an R of 0.4. What that's telling me, given all the nasty things I've said about experimentalists, is how great detectors you built, right? I mean, the granularity, the resolution size of CMS and Atlas is truly amazing. So. The fact that you can look at the structure inside a radius of 0.4 and do something with it means that your resolution power is much smaller than 0.4, smaller than 0.1. And it's really amazing how well that's worked. I was just, I mean, UA1 had a, a size of about a radian per slug of lead glass, right, kind of thing. And so I grew up with that, as you've now learned. And the detectors at the LHC are just amazing gadgets. I mean, they, they resolve the structure of the universe at such a fine scale that you can do these little tiny jets and there's enough energy to boost interesting things into one jet like that. Well, typically what you do is take a big jet and then break it into small jets as we'll talk about, but it's, it's a real ode to the quality, the engineering of those gadgets. How will they work and how fine the resolution is. So forget everything nasty I said about my experimentalist friends, right? Don't tell them now that it's been recorded, right? And we'll talk some about that in the second half, but you're absolutely right. It's optimizing your ability. We're, 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 we're going to go from counting jets to using jets as taggers of interesting physics, that is a top jet, a W jet, a Z jet, and groomers to get rid of the extra stuff. And that's a different game. And so we'll use the jets in a different way. And it was a big transition in going from, remember there was a long break. The Tevatron got shut down 15 years before the LHC turned on. And there was, I mean, the Tevatron eventually turned back on in 2000, but we had a lot of time to think about what was going to happen. And then there was the run up to the LHC how many people know about the LHC Olympics? Right, that taught us a lot in that break because there were these competitions. 
well-known but untrustworthy theorists would make data with various kinds of SUSY signals hidden in it and pass it out to the world and the world working in groups was supposed to go and see if they could find out what it was and then we had these meetings when you would get a prize, typically a cup of coffee, if you had correctly identified what some disreputable person had hidden in the so-called data. And then we learned that probably small jets would be useful along with the big, big jets. I'm sorry. You should take your break, right? Otherwise, I'll just keep talking. Okay. Say? Can I make one comment? Well, is it a good one? <laughs> no, it depends. I, I apologize. Go ahead. Basically, I have to give. Let's hear it for a lap. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, except it was so simple compared. Yeah, but it did establish your individuality. Yes. In a very strong way because of the absence of some of the misconceptions. Yeah, no, you're right. Everybody get the message? There was this machine which I didn't mention it all. But where, right, the properties of the Z and, and, and the QCD part were, I mean, there, I didn't show the slide, but there used to be a slide that's really pointed out. Opal did some really cool things in terms of trying to do, identify gluons versus quarks. Were you on Opal? Pardon? Were you on Opal? No. Oh. Okay. I think it's something good. Yeah. No, I, you're absolutely right. I, uh, my bias is that the big step was going back to the Hadron Collider, but you're right. LEP was really important. And you built a tunnel. Right? Couldn't have an LHC. I stand corrected. That's good. Anything else that's important that I left out? Yeah, uh, depend, I mean, you're right, and, and there's, a, there's an algorithm called telescoping jets, but it really depends on what was said back there. It, what physics are you looking for? We'll, I mean, we'll talk about that if I ever get to shut up and then have a second talk. Yeah, but bring it up. I, you're right. The truth is it's never done anything really slick for us, but in a sense, looking at the substructure says I... I I've, identify a cluster of things I think are important, then I look inside it for smaller jet structure. And that's the way a lot of the structure games are played. 